All right, all right. What's going on, guys? And I want to welcome you guys back to another Lockout Men podcast. Today is a special day. I finally tracked down my owner operator. Going to get into uh, get into a little conversation with him on um, on how this owner operation thing works in trucking, man. Maybe you guys might want to be an owner operator one day. Hell, maybe I might want to be an owner operator one day. I don't know. I don't know. But um, let's see what let's see what this gentleman got to say about it. You know what I'm saying? So let's go ahead and uh, bring myself in there. Look how pretty I am. What's going on, guys? Lockout men here with another podcast for you, another interview. We about to chop it up today with a gentleman. I'm about to bring his uh, video up. There we go. There we go. Let's see. Uh, let's see what what my man got to say about owner operating or owner operator truckers learning by trucking inside. Let's see what he has to say. Okay, get used to it. It it happens. It happens to the best of us. All right. This is what separates the boys from the men. All right, seriously. You can go back and lease on to somebody. That's a real bad ideal. You want to pull through this. No matter how you have to pull through it, you have to pull through it. Don't quit. Don't be a quitter, man. Because let me tell you what happens to quitters. They quit during this time. They find themselves back company, doing a job, and then want this back when the market's better. Okay? It's not how you pass through the times, all right? Because, dude, quitting just takes you right back to the bottom, and you got to start all over again, all right? So do realize that, all right? Uh, my true beliefs, man, we were all born for this moment. Seriously. You were born for this moment. So just get through it. You're going to get through it. However you get through it, when you come out the other end, it's going to be a lot better for you. All right, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's bring him on, my man. In what is it? How am I pronouncing it right? Trucking inside or inside trucking? It's trucking inside. Trucking inside. Let's bring him on to the show. What's going on, big man? What's going on? Not much, brother. All right, so uh, I got I got a little bit about a uh, little bit about you, man. You said you uh, started your career back in uh, 1995, so you got a so you got a a little bit over 20 years on your on your back, huh? Yes, sir. 27. 27 years, man. Out of the 27 years, man, what, what's all the craziness? Talk to me. What, what's all the craziness that you that you seen and came came across out here? And you can, you can go through the list. I mean, just about everything you can imagine. And it gets bigger every day. You say it gets bigger every day. All right. So, every day. So for my listeners and my viewers that don't know who you are, man, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell them where you come from. Okay. Um, this is, you know, I started trucking inside because my past, I started out as a company driver. And uh, in 2000, I decided to do a lease purchase. And at that moment, I realized I really like owning a truck. So I went out and started purchasing trucks. I started my first trucking company in 2003, which was named Madison Mudder. Mm -hmm. Hello? You still there? Oh, hello? I think I lost you. Hold on. I think I, think I lost you. I think your headset went off. Hold on. You are you there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Phone separated you, from the headset. Yeah, that's what I was about to ask you. Uh, are, are you talking to me through your headset? Yeah. Uh, probably might be better to talk to me through the through the phone. Uh, my truck's idling. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Well, no, that's. I mean, that's cool. Yeah. We we can still. It just it just disconnected. It won't connect again. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, it won't disconnect again. Oh, okay. Um, All right. Go ahead and continue. Okay. Anyway, um, it was kind of a flop, and, I mean, I had a lot to learn. You know, I kept just pulling anything and everything, and 
uh, decided to get into the broker business and the permitting business and started help working with a lot of truckers who had been in the business for many, many years. I started picking their brains. And I just really learned a lot over the years. And then in uh, 2008, the economy collapsed. My businesses went under. And uh, I spent two years just doing nothing but research of trucking. Okay. And okay. So in uh, 2010, I jumped back into the industry, went back through the company process. Um, from 2010 to 2012, I went from company driver to a lease owner operator, and then I purchased my first truck in 2012 again, and uh, been growing ever since. You know, so you said started my uh, Ever Madison truck, and then started growing. All right, so you started you started the business you you started the business at one time. And then, unfortunately, it it went it went down because of the because of the industry. And then you just decided to start it back up. But in the beginning, uh, let's let's go back to the beginning. Let's see where you where you started. So, did you was was you grandfathered in to get your your CDL? Was you uh, did you uh, go to school for your CDL, or did you uh, you know? Yeah, I went through. Uh a company called Harold Ives, which actually got bought out by Covenant. Mm -hmm. But I went through them, get my CDLs. I was 22 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had done a lot of things prior to trucking. And what kind of got me into trucking is I went to work for a tow company. And I seen the money they were, they were making. And, you know, back in 1995, $1,000 was a lot of money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. especially, I just decided, you know, I'm going to do this, you know. Especially in the tow company. I, I used to I used to run, a, um, before I got in the truck, you know, I, I ran a, uh, a roadside business. And that was, the, you know, the reason why I got in the trucking was to save up some money so I can, you know, get, you know, get the wrecker, get the uh the toll record, the flatbed is, and all like that. And then somebody told me, they was like, well, you know, the tow truck guys, the tow truck companies that actually tows the trucks makes a little bit more money. I was like, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, really? I, yeah. I, I mean, I've seen a lot of them guys. I've seen a lot of them guys make anywhere from $1,800, $2,800 a week. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm thinking, man, I could do this now. It's, you know, and, so I jumped in. I never got back in the tow business, but, you know, I just ended up, you know, driving for a while, and then I decided I'd try on in a truck, and then I realized that it wasn't so hard to get your own authority, and I said, well, let me give this a shot. All right. So, so, for, so, for, the, so for the people that's, you know, a lot, so in your opinion, uh, in, in your opinion, what do you, what do you think? a person that's interested in owning a truck, how long, how long should that person, uh, how, how long should that person be in the industry before he decide to get his own, uh, get his own truck? My personal opinion, I'd say, you know, at least five years, because to be honest with you, I mean, even five years is premature to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I was in it for five years before I started a trucking business. I mean, before I even got a truck, you know, I did the lease purchase. And, uh, you know, the lease purchase, I mean, it's good to, you know, kind of learn, start learning. But it's really, you don't get the true feeling of actually owning a truck. I mean, a lease purchase, you can walk away from. Truck, you can't. Okay. You know? I mean, not without ruining your life or your credit. You know? So, you you know, from lease purchase to uh, owning one, it's a total different feeling. And I know when I first came out here owning my own, you know, you worry about this thing going down all the time, you know. And for a guy that's only got five years, I mean, that's tough because you don't know nothing about the mechanics of trucking. You know, you barely even know how to drive. Right, right. You know, and if you can drive, after five years, I mean, you're still got to learn how to, how the markets work. You know, if you're getting ripped off in truck repair shops, I mean, there's a lot of trial and error there. Now, the good thing is the industry today has YouTube to depend on. They can kind of go out there and get a feeling of it. See, in 1995, you didn't have that. You didn't have the ability to listen to somebody else. I mean, you may meet a 
trucker and a truck stop, but you don't really get the true story. So, okay. Okay. I mean, it's just really the industry is up to date now because you can go on YouTube and you've got thousands of owner operators putting their own opinion out there. And you can take all of them's opinion and kind of hear their story and kind of see how they're doing it, you know. Now, that's and that's and that's what it is. It's only opinions, though, because a lot of a lot of YouTubers out here gives a lot a lot of different opinions. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Hell, some of them can even be uh, falsified because some of them only like to tell you the good side of trucking. Like, yeah, this is how much I'm making and you can do this and do that. But they don't want to turn around and tell you the bad side of it. Like when your truck break down, how much it's going to cost to get your truck back up, how long it's going to be before you get back out there to start making money. Let people know that your truck is the money maker. You know what I'm saying? If 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 your truck is broke down, you're not making no money. How how are you uh, subsidizing your your finances if your truck is broke down? What, what do you do? I mean, to be honest with you. A lot of guys use credit. I use savings. You know, uh, when times are good, you need to be stacking as much as possible. I mean, just stacking. You know, don't build a bunch of debt during that time. I know back in 2018, everybody just started rushing out to buy trucks, mm-hmm. buy trucks, buy trucks, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of those trucks in it are now getting repoed, you know. They're trying to hold together a five-man fleet on the spot market. And the spot market's not meant for that. Spot markets, you're really good on getting away with one or two trucks. Maybe three, you know, you start getting five and six. You don't want to be on the spot market. You want solid customers, you know, and customers not being a freight broker, customers being a shipper. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to work toward that. If you're still on the spot market and you're trying to build five truck fleet, I promise you at some point you will crash and burn. Okay, now let me, right now is the toughest time. Let me let me stop you right there. Now I hear uh, I hear you and a lot of other people talking. Uh, spot market for the people that don't know what that is let let them let them know what what spot market is okay uh the spot market is any loads that you get on the load board and how they end up on the spot market is it's a kind of an overflow from shippers that uh the carrier can actually carry themselves so they broker it out um then you have you know, companies like TQL and CH Robinson, who are not trucking companies per se, they're more like brokers. They go out and they find these shippers and they get contracts with them and they'll sell them on to the spot market for a tremendous amount of money. Um, and in most cases, they're going to win in the market because um, they can take that load for four grand and turn around and get it moved for 1200 to a truck. So, okay. Okay. uh, brokers do take more than their fair share, but you know, brokers do have a lot harder time getting the customer than the trucking company because the trucking company is direct. They own the truck, they own the trailer, they, you know, they own all the equipment, they have drivers driving for them and getting a shipper is a lot easier than a broker getting the shipper because a broker has to sell them on the concept that look we got a database for over 120,000 carriers in it and uh we can get your product moved but then they fail more than they succeed okay. you know there's a lot of shipments that roll over to the next day the next day so this these things end up on the spot market uh now the brokers will sell back to other carriers big carriers the fortune 500 companies when those big carriers have too many trucks in an area, they will sell back to them. But see, when they sell back to the big carriers, they know they can't shaft them of, you know, 75% of the load. Okay. So th- they kind of get that. Um, but the spot market simply is like the stock market. I mean, if you watch stock market and the spot market, they fluctuate together. Okay. Stock market starts to crash. So does the freight market spot market starts to crash. And when the, uh, stock market starts to go back up. Spot market starts to go back up. Okay. okay. So that's what the spot market is. All right. All right. So all right. So with so they it also opens up. Uh, it also opens up more 
uh, more opportunities for truckers to look for loads. But in your opinion, you say don't just don't just use the spot market. Use just use it as what would you what would you say use it as uh, as a supplement, pretty much. Yeah, the spot market's a filler. I mean, it's just a filler. If you say you find, I mean, a lot of guys first stop out, step out into the spot market because coming out the gate and trying to get a shipper as a customer. I mean, a lot of people will tell you, go get the shipper first, then buy the truck. Well, shippers don't even want to talk to you until you got the truck. So this is what ends up happening. Guys, as an owner operator, leased on to a carrier, they'll step out on their own, get their own authority. And then they will jump right into the spot market, start turning some revenue. And at the same token, when they got some free time or even while they're driving, they're talking to shippers, trying to arrange something dedicated out of the home base, my home base being Alabama. So once you get a customer there, you know, if you make enough phone calls, you eventually get the customer. And when you do get the customer there, now that you're, that's your customer now. You know, you're going in there all the time, feeding your truck in there all the time to get reloaded. And now that's where the spot market really comes in to be very handy because if you got a dedicated run running to Chicago, and it's not always dedicated, but let's just say you did, now you can just get that backhaul out of Chicago back to Alabama to get your next load and your next load. And then you just kind of feed that. And once this thing's solid and you know it's going to be solid, then you look for a return load instead of using the spot market. Then you could start calling a bunch of shippers around Chicago area and try to get your load coming back into Alabama direct. So now you got something actually that you can just about bank on. So you got to wean yourself off the spot market. You know, even the big guys, they use the spot market, but that's not majority of their freight. But the problem we have in this industry is everybody wants to run it as the majority of their freight. And that's the reason why you have all this crashing and then grow, crash and grow. You know, this, this business is just continuously up and down on the spot market. Okay. Now, what about now? As 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 I'm as I'm learning this industry and and learning the different uh you know the different ropes of this uh industry, I just you know just learned a little bit more on what the spot market is because, like I said, I I hear a lot of people talking about it, and this is one of the roles that I need to learn when it comes to you know going you know transitioning into owning my own truck. Now, that's one way. Now, you mentioned, you know, trying to get uh, dedicated shippers. How would one go by uh, getting dedicated shippers? What, what would be the process of, of doing, of going that route? Well, first of all, you know, start from your home base. I mean, believe it or not, talk to some of your friends, families, and things like that. I know a lot of your friends and family probably work in a manufacturer or somewhere that's shipping a product and talk to them and see who they can contact shipments and, you know, have your friend go in there and just say the guy's name's Chris. He runs the shipping department. How about you have your buddy go in there and talk to Chris and find out who arranges all the transportation Okay. and see, if, you know, and just kind of tell, have him tell Chris, Hey, I got a buddy that, uh, he, uh, he owns a trucking company and he's looking for some direct freight and Chris will know what he's talking about. And Chris will give him a name and telephone number and then contact that guy. You know, Chris may be the guy. Okay. Okay. But nine times out of 10, the guy that runs the shipping department, he does not control the transportation. Gotcha. He just loads the trucks and, you know, wraps it, whatever. Uh, there's somebody else at corporate that does all the, the uh, arrangement of transportation. Just to kind of explain, my first contract was with Johnson Control out okay. of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Yeah, I, okay? I, I pulled freight. And, I pulled freight from them before. Yep. Yeah. And back when General Motors had a big manufacturer there in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, I noticed right down the road from my office was a uh, office that said Johnson Control. So I walked into Johnson Control, 
and was talking to the secretary and handed her a business card and asked to see somebody in shipping. So I sat there and waited probably about 30 minutes, and the guy walked out and handed me my business card. I started explaining why I was there, Mm -hmm. and he said, well, I'll pass the business card on. I left there, went straight to work, back to work, and as soon as I walked in the office, there was a guy on hold from Johnson Control. It got that fast Mm. up to corporate in Chicago, Mm. okay? So it went down pretty fast. The guy told me he had this dedicated lane, three loads a day coming out of Jefferson City, Missouri, down to the GM plant, had to have at least nine trailers drop and hook. And they were 3,000 pounds, and what they were was seat cushions. Okay. Okay. So that was my first contract, and you can't get lucky like that. And I got real lucky. I had been in business for like a year. Sorry about that. We lost we lost contact. That's why I do not like using. <laughs> that's why I don't like using my phone because when the other phone when when the other when the other one rings, it cuts this off. <laughs> I got you. Uh, I got you. Yeah. So I'll, I'll call them back in a bit. Um, but you were saying that you got lucky with, with, uh, with your first contract. Go ahead. Yeah, I got very lucky. I mean, it, it happened so quickly, but however, you know, we conversated for about three weeks and, uh, you know, because they had this contract that just got released and I had to have nine trailers. So it took about two weeks to eventually start dropping trailers up on that end and start moving the product. But we did finally come to an agreement on the rate. Okay. And, you know, the first time that I started my trucking company, there really wasn't any fuel surcharge out there. All right, we're, we're good. <laughs> had, yeah, they, that, that was that – It's was, all right, yeah. brother. All right. Um, all right, so you were saying there, there wasn't no uh, surcharge. All right, so continue. Yeah, and, you know, 2003, a lot of guys don't know this, but, you know, fuel surcharge is kind of a new – new thing to the industry because you know after 9-11 fuel prices started skyrocketing right you know these these carriers had to find a way to offset because you know everything used to be just direct line haul Mm -hmm. you know and uh because fuel didn't flux away that much and then they started throwing in fuel surcharge even when you released onto a carrier you know they gave you that 87 cents a mile straight across the board and then eventually, you know, they started at fuel surcharge, which you know, when, when I first started getting fuel surcharge, that was two or three cents, you know, pile okay. for the fuel surcharge. Now, you know, you see it 43 and 36 cents a mile fuel surcharge. So now what is that's now, a big difference. Now, what is now now as as I'm as I'm sitting here listening and learning. What is the what is the difference on the fuel surcharge? Because I hear when a lot of companies uh, offer lease purchase to a driver that's that want to go lease purchase with with said company, they they s- introduce fuel surcharge. So is that's is is that like okay? So I'm I'm at I'm at the fuel station. The fuel is a dollar. Let's say a dollar fifty nine cent, but I don't pay that dollar fifty nine cent. I I pay no. whatever they whatever they say that the fuel is. How that work? No, uh, the way it works. All right, on a fuel surcharge, every carrier creates a chart going off what they call the DOE, which is the Department of Energy mm-hmm. website, which tells you the national average of fuel comes out every Tuesday. Tells you what the national average of fuel is. And some of them even break it down as regional, you know, which you can get that information off the DOE website. Uh, that's a government website that tells you, you know, what the average of fuel cost is nationwide. Okay. Now, what the carriers do is they build their chart based on they're not going to pay no more than a dollar or a quarter for fuel. Okay. Everything else is going to be charged back to the shipper or whoever's paying the bill. And that's how they come up with their fuel surcharge. Oh, you know, okay. they'll base it on if their fleet's getting six miles to the gallon, they'll say, okay, the whole fleet's getting, you know, average six miles to the gallon. So they'll take the six miles to the gallon, add up what the fuel price is, and this is what the fuel surcharge is going to be. If the fuel's priced between this amount and this amount, 
it's going to be 36 cents a mile fuel surcharge. Okay. And then it go up 37, 38, you know, it just goes up or goes down, you know. So what it does, it makes them on a competitive level on the line haul and not the fuel. Okay. See, okay. when the fuel starts going skyrocketed, then, you know, they're all scrambling trying to figure out, okay, what should I be charging on this line haul? And so that really sets them off base. But basically all your major carriers out there are on the same chart for fuel, you know, give a few pennies here and there. So whenever they're going after the customer, they're now competing with line haul, not competing with fuel prices or discounts that may be included. Now, now I, I thought the, 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 the most overhead for a truck is the fuel. Would you agree with that? Yeah. If you're not getting reimbursed for it. Okay. Okay. I mean, the most expensive thing in, in trucks is the insurance and repairs. I mean, from tires, to motors, to you know, your PM services and things like that. That's where you're going to dump most of your money into okay. over a year time. Okay. Because you know you you putting so much you you putting so much stress and so much into the truck within that first year, of course. Even if it's a new truck, it's gonna break down like that. Oh yeah, I mean, new trucks are um, really likely to break down more than old trucks. You know, because the new trucks have a lot of glitches in them whenever they first come out the gate. It's just like buying a new car. You know. Um, if you get a new car that nobody's ever made before, that thing's going to have so many glitches. Anything electronic, if it's first to the market, it's going to have so many glitches. Now, the problem is with trucks these days is they're changing every single year. Right. You know, it's got all these new features, and mm-hmm. nobody's familiar with those features. And that's the reason why when the DEF, the, the, uh, the DPF systems and all the EGR systems started coming in in 2005. I'd say from 2005 to 2012 was some of the worst equipment ever put out because people were trying to perfect it and uh, at the expense of us carriers. So, okay. you know, your new trucks could have a lot of issues where if you go buy a truck that's a few years old that ain't in those years, um, like mine's a 2016. I've not had a lick of problems out of this. But my Kenworth 2013 I had to put a new motor in it. Wow. So, wow. I mean, oh. that's a big cost right there. Yeah, through 2013 and 2016. Wow. <laughs> you're not having no you're not having no kind of issues with uh with your with your 2016. So that's why that's why a lot of uh, uh, a lot of old schoolers they they keen on saying, "Yo, don't don't buy a new truck." They they always say get you get you an old truck, and I never understood that because I always thought, hey, if I get me a new truck, I wouldn't I wouldn't experience any problems yet. Plus, I still got the plus I still got the 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 what do you call it the warranty, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. But see, if you get a truck with you know four hundred thousand miles on it. You know, like this truck here, I got it with 382,000 miles on it, so it did have a little bit of factory warranty left. Mm-hmm. Um, what you've done, and it's really good to buy a fleet truck, you know, something that Swift had or something that a big fleet had uh, because their maintenance programs are not neglected right. at they, all. Yeah, they, they, you know? they keep up on they, they keep up on their maintenance on their trucks. That's right. They keep up on the maintenance so strict that uh, – you know, you, you you know, if anything wore out in that process, they're going to jump right on and fix it. Okay. You know, it's not going to run up and down the road and be neglected. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you do buy a truck that's not fleet, I mean, you, you just got to look at it this way. Whoever had it before you has worked out all the bugs. And it does have a track record. So if you're going to buy a Volvo, all you have to do is contact the Volvo. And uh, they can give you a list of the maintenance on it. Oh, okay. What major repairs have been done on it. All you got to do is get a VIN. You can run it. You know, and see what what kind of maintenance has been done on it, and take your own opinion if it's just normal maintenance, or you know, just some normal parts that go on out, like EGR coolers and things like that. And okay. but if they give you a list that's a mile long, you may not want to buy that truck. Okay, that's you a, may want to just reconsider another truck. That's some good advice right there. That is some good advice. So can can we do that with with, with other uh with other trucks as well? You know, like Freightliners, Kenworths, or will Volvo will be the, sure. the king will be the king of 
of finding out what's the problems with the trucks, if there was any in the past? No, I mean, you can find out anything from Freightliner, Volvo, any of that. Um, the same with the motors. Say, for instance, you get a Volvo with a Cummins in it. Well, Volvo know about the truck, but not necessarily well they know everything about the Cummins motor. Okay. So then you can contact Cummins, and, find and Cummins can give you a maintenance. Yeah. Okay, that's some good Cummins advice. Cummins can give you the maintenance on it. That's some good advice right there. All right. So we, we, we spoke on spot markets. We spoke on uh, direct uh, direct uh, company. Now, what about uh, now brokers? Uh, I'm, I'm hearing – I'm hearing a lot these days, it's especially these days, with with brokers that's just not being cool with you guys out there. Um, they they offering what you guys is calling cheap freight. Now, be being that I'm I'm a company driver, I was looking at that. Uh, I, I was looking at that at one point, like, well, why not just take the cheap freight and then you know, the supplement when you can find something that's more profitable. A- am I safe to say that? What, you know, you're an owner operator. What, what, what do you say? What do you say to somebody that says that? Okay. Um, first of all, you know, this is what you get when you work a spot market, just like stock market, it crashes. A lot of people lose a lot of money and go out of business. I mean, lose homes, cars, everything like that. You're playing with the spot market. It's just like stock market. It has crashed. And the reason why it's crashed is we shut this whole entire country down. People could not go to work. If people's not going to work, who's going to load your truck? And then, you know, they started giving out these essential tickets. You know, well, you're essential, so you can go to work still. But then, you know, steel pipe that's going out to, uh, say, the oil field. It's not moving right now. It's sitting still. Right. So now that flatbedder is looking for freight. You know, he's starving for it. Now, I'm not taking up for the brokers, but I do understand how brokerage businesses work. They have X amount of loads a day coming in, and they've built their business on those X amount of loads. When you crash a market like this, they got a fluctuation of low freight out there. See, there was a story that all these mega fleets went out there and bought all the freight off the industry. Right. Well, a lot of their freight did fall off. A lot of their freight did fall off, even the big carriers. But, uh, you know, the big carriers really ain't gone out there and bought up a lot. You know, uh, there's a lot of owner operators that are leased on the big carriers that are sitting at home right now because the carrier has sent them home due to the fact that you can't promise a, uh, an owner operator a dollar forty six a mile when your freight's only paying a dollar twelve. They're not going to pay that carrier just to be paying right. for that owner operator. Right. All right. Uh, company drivers, you know, company drivers are kind of solid in there because somebody's got to move their company equipment. Exactly. So if a guy's making forty two fifty two cents a mile, you might find them kind of neglecting a few things because you know they're not going to lose money on load. Okay, they're just not going to lose money. They're going to stay solid on their on um, making sure that that truck brings in enough money to move it. Now that's the reason why you're seeing company drivers sitting in truck stops because their company does not have any freight right now that will pay the bills basically. Okay. Um, so you know, I mean, this is just what you get when you're playing with the spot market when the freight falls off. That freight broker has a family, too, and he's got to make X amount of dollars. Guess what? That's his customer. It's not yours. So he's going to take the first dibs on that load. So if he could shave 75 85% off the top to make sure that he gets a check every Friday, because 99% of the people that you talk to from the load boards are not the actual broker. 99% of them are agents that work for the brokerage. Okay. So the brokerage hands them down an allowance that they can spend. And out of that allowance, they got to figure out how they're going to get their commission. So if they're getting a thousand dollars on this load as an allowance, they're going to try to move that baby at 600 bucks. That way they're making almost as much as you each week, but they just don't have equipment, you know? So how do you feel? So, how, how do you feel about these? How do you feel about these truckers uh, that's doing the protesting right now? 
Um, they can do it. It's a bad time to do it. I mean, seriously, what kind of leverage do you have? I mean, you have no leverage. I mean, there's no shipment sitting on docks waiting on drivers. Drivers are still getting in there and picking it up. And then there's the, the follic way of looking at this is we're going to get the owner operators to shut down. Man, they've been talking that since the seventies and ain't never happened. and ain't <laughs> never going to happen. I know. Right. I mean, I, I know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you can't get them all on the same page. That's just never going to happen. You'll have guys out there protesting right now, but then when the market's up, when they should be protesting for more rates, instead they're doing fine. They're doing, you know, exactly. the guys that were protesting, and when you say, hey, this is the time we go on strike, they say, oh, I'm doing great. I'm getting $2 a mile, not realizing the freight's paying $5 a mile. Mm. And mm. see, I, I've learned to read those markets, and during the good times, I am getting 3 4 and $5 a mile on everything, okay. you know, from the spot market. Okay. But, like, right now, you lucky to get a buck a mile. I mean, if you're getting a buck fifty, you're lucky. So, but you got to learn to manage and run your business on that. I mean, you got two choices, go home, sit, or you'd be out here running. I don't know how long this business is going to be down. So, uh, the money I do have in reserve, do I spend it or do I keep stacking? You, try you know, to keep, so I'm going to just run stacking. through these moments and that's right. You know, try to get at least two or $3 out of this load, you know, after paying the bills, two or $3 adding to that money that's in reserve, it just stacks up, okay. you know? Now you've been now you've been doing this for uh, an awfully uh, an awful long time, man. You started uh, you started you started in '95. You became a owner operator in 2000, and you got your first truck in uh, 2003. But then from there, you you jump into uh, into a brokerage business. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, you know. I- be honest with you, I started the brokerage business thinking the brokers was going to be better than the trucking business. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, okay, I don't have to own any trucks at this point, so I don't have the repairs and maintenance and things like that. So I decided, okay, let me get a brokerage authority. So I got my first brokerage authority, and uh, the roadblock I hit every time I'd go in and talk to the shippers is, do you own equipment? Nope, don't want to talk to you. Oh, you know, okay. and I said, well, this is kind of crazy, you know, because how these guys get loads. So, you know, eventually making enough calls, I eventually got somebody, which was Windward Petroleum out of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, mm-hmm. and uh, was moving pipe. And it didn't pay all that good, but, you know, we was moving it. And uh, we started picking up other ones like Fast and and things like that. Okay. And, uh, but the problem is, as a broker, you got to realize too. You know, you take some of the responsibilities. So if trucks are in accidents or rollovers and products damaged, you're the first one that's going to lose your paycheck until you can collect through the insurance because the shipper's not going to pay you until this matter's resolved. So, and you know, as far as the carrier goes, you know, you still got to pay the carrier in ample time, or that's a late payment. Uh-huh. You see what I'm saying? So you can get in some bad situations through the brokerage. Um, the only reason why I even shut my brokerage down is I was doing some other things in the permitting business and decided to go full time in the permitting business, helping guys get legal and know their fuel taxes and things like that, that, uh, I just decided it was just too much of my time. So I ended up shutting down the brokerage and just focusing in on the permitting side of things up until the economy crashed. Okay. So when you so before the before the economy crashed, you uh, you had a combination of five businesses in trucking with over thirty eight employees, uh, mm-hmm. with uh, two offices, one in Oklahoma. I'm assuming Oklahoma is your home state, and uh, Georgia. Nope. Uh, nope. Oh. Nope. Nope. Um, I started my first business, big business, in uh, Oklahoma City, okay. and I ended up moving up there. I'm originally from Alabama, Georgia, where I live right now in Salem, Alabama. Okay. Um, my stomping grounds is just right across the river, Columbus, Georgia. Okay. That's where I grew up from the age of five till, you know, I moved out to Oklahoma in 2002. But um, hell, uh, yeah, I mean, look like we're gonna have to look like we're gonna have to make this a part two. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we're like we're gonna have to make this a part two, man, because this is a good conversation, and they uh, and my peoples keep uh, calling me off the hook. So, uh, what's I your, hear you, brother. So, what's uh, trucking? Truck? The, 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 uh, where can people go? Where can people go to to get all this good information, man? Because I mean, you 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 are such a uh, such a jewels i mean you got so much jewels to offer to to uh young truck drivers that's coming into this industry where can they where where can they find you at well first they can find me on youtube at trucking inside and they can also find my website at truckinginside.com all right all right so uh damn i never did get your name man i never got your name my, bro. my Just, name's yeah, that's fine my name's everett Everett, well, hey man, look, Madison. look, man. Uh, sorry to sorry to cut this short and uh, short and sweet, but the little bit of information that I did get from you is, I, I mean, I'm 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 at all right now. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I learned I learned uh, so much within the uh, within the uh, 45 minutes of being on the phone with you than I ever learned from my whole five years experience in this industry, man. So I will definitely, definitely reach back out to you and we will definitely continue this conversation, uh, in the future, man. So before, uh, before I let you go though, uh, where, what, what, what are you doing right now? And what, uh, what, what are you doing right now to, to get, to get you out of this, COVID-19 thing? I'm just loading and rolling, brother. You know, picking out what I can pick and you know, that's part of owning a business is digging deep and finding the best freight you can. You know, look at the market and dig as deep as you can. Try to negotiate something. But you know, in markets like this, there's not a whole lot of negotiating room. It's either sit or run it. That's it, man. And also right here, you says uh, you says you preach the most important keys about this system. And the biggest thing is to never give up, never quit. You know, as you said, it's, it's hard right now, but that's your model right now. You say never give up, never quit. Uh, what what uh, what advice what advice on top of that that you can uh, give us uh, us new jacks out here? I mean, be honest with you, just make the best choices, man. But, I mean, the main ingredients is never giving up, man. Just keep moving forward, cut costs in every way you can, and just keep rocking and rolling. I mean, some things are going to get neglected in these moments. If you can fix them or put a Band-Aid on it temporarily, do so, you know, just to get through these moments. Now, hopefully you have some kind of reserve and been doing this for a little bit, but it's going to be real tough on guys that's not had at least a year in. So... All right. All I mean, right. just kind of stick it out. All right. Well, Everett, Trucking Insider, thank you very much for coming on. I really do appreciate it. And we're definitely going to continue this conversation again, man, in, uh, in the future. So uh, definitely inspect, uh, inspect another reach out for me. I mean, from me, because... Uh, like I said, we we still we we only we only scratched the surface right here. We we haven't even we haven't even got like we haven't even delved into in into the meat of the trucking industry right now, man. My man right here with 27 years of experience, you guys can look for him if you want more information about him. Definitely look at his uh website, trucking in trucking inside and his YouTube page which is trucking inside. You know, and uh, maybe if you want to, you know, talk to him and get some information yourself from him, he's he's right here. So definitely, uh, definitely a man of knowledge. Uh, Twenty seven years. Uh, he, he he pretty much done it all. So if anybody if, if you guys are interested in finding out more about what this man got to say, check him out on his YouTube page. Everett, thank you for showing up and showing out. On the uh, podcast, man, I thank you very much. You're welcome, brother. All right, all right. Everybody, this is Everett. I am Lockout Men. I appreciate you guys joining me today. If you guys like content like this and more, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, share, and hit that bell and more, that more button 
you know, where it says the bell and you got to choose between all and all that good stuff. Y'all want to, y'all might want to hit that. And if you guys want to come on the podcast, hit me up at lockoutmenpodcast at gmail.com. And on that note, we are gone.